that, that's where I think that, again, like for me, it's really empowering to really explore history from this standpoint because yeah. we're living in history. We're also living in the consequence of historical ideas and intentions and the failure of ideas. Some good ideas failed to take hold while bad ideas uh, dominated. And, and so we have this um, interesting battle of concepts over the course of many, many, many hundreds of year, years that are investigatable. You can look at like, what were these different futures that different people wanted to bring into being and how did they clash, right? Um, so you could see where this is not new. The, the, the oligarchy's uh, creation of a system of total, total submission and dominance under a unipolar you know, world type of you know, new Roman empire or something. That's not a new idea in the modern age. This goes back all throughout the last 2000, 3000, 4,000 probably years. And every time that the empire gets close to achieving what they want, they break down, they start self cannibalizing their own existence. Yeah. And oftentimes, I mean, not, sometimes when we're lucky, um, qualified leaders arise and take advantage of the oligarchy's fundamental incompetence. Um, people, and I, that's why I brought up Wallace and Roosevelt, because Wallace and Roosevelt were two wonderful exemplars who were, we can learn so much from by looking at the battles, the drama behind the scenes that shape these legal documents. Because um, a lot of people, they get stuck in technicalities and ivory tower academia when they just like nitpick legalities. And it's like, no, but you're missing the the, the contour, the qualities, the ideas in the, in the environment that shape these shadows that were written down for you. Um, so actually what I wanted to maybe, that being said, I'm going to share a screen here. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. I love this picture because <clears throat> throughout the entirety that Roosevelt met Churchill three times. Stalin really liked Roosevelt a lot. Stalin had been, uh, through some crazy, crazy stuff in Russia. I mean, anybody looking at Trotsky's conspiracy where Trotsky was, you know, <laughs> had this weird, weird relationship with Japanese fascists, uh, Nazis to, you know, in, in both in Ukraine, as well as in Germany, as well as the, uh, Western establishment, Trotsky had a whole, uh, program to, uh, to, you know, take over Russia, uh, kill Stalin, take over Russia. And, and there's uh, some wonderful writings that I'm, I'm beginning to read now by Grover Fur. uh, these incredible pieces of research piecing together these battles that were happening inside of Russia itself. Um, and uh, and Stalin was like looking at how the hell did Roosevelt manage to do the New Deal, break the Wall Street banks, break London, and they had an affinity. Neither one of them trusted Churchill at all, nor should they have. It was, you know, and that's why you'll always see Roosevelt in between Stalin and Churchill. You'll never see Stalin and Churchill sitting together in one of these like trifecta meetings. Um, and this one's a great picture because I think this is in Morocco um, in 43 where it was becoming very clear to Churchill that the empire was going to be taken down by, by Roosevelt. Um, I've got a little citation of a, of a, of a confrontation both of them had that was recorded by Roosevelt's son, who was also FDR's assistant. So you got the legal foundations of modern, modern law. The, I mentioned the, the UN charter, the Atlantic charter. Uh, these are all based upon along with the four freedoms. They're based upon the enshrinement of the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648. Every legal scholar will agree that the Treaty of Westphalia set the tone for these things. Um, Tony Blair and Henry Kissinger have come out saying we need to enter the post-Westphalian era. Um, most people don't know what they're talking about because they don't know their history because we've all been submitted to an imperial education, which it doesn't give us this history. Now, these guys who are, who are not given community college educations, they are given an understanding of history. And they, they also understood how historical forces act on the present. So when they say we need a post-Westphalian era, they understand what they're talking about. Westphalia, for those who don't know, is very important. I gave a class on this two weeks ago. It's available uh, on YouTube. But <clears throat> this put an end to 30 years of religious war that were funded by the Venetian uh, financiers. So Venice was the center of world finance back in the 17th century and, and earlier. For about a thousand years, it was the world center of finance. It controlled international bullion, international silver, international sea trade. Um, going back all the way through Asia, uh, this was Venetian dominated. Venice was the zone where many of the leading, most virulent families of the Roman Empire moved after Rome collapsed in 14, uh, from 400 to 450. 
when the the you know the Huns and the and the Visigoths uh, sacked Rome, basically the the uh, inner elites had to either die or to survive they had to migrate, and a bunch of them migrated uh, and reconstituted themselves in the lagoons of Venice, uh, in the sort of the the armpit of uh, of Italy. And that became a, a sort of zone of evil for a very long time. They sacked Constantinople. They worked with the Mongols. People like, uh, uh, geez, uh, Marco Polo and his father were advisors to the Khans, the Kublai Kai, and provided strategic intelligence for the Khans when they wanted to start invading West and take over the world. They were, the, the Venetians were the only, only power that was given tr monopolies over trade routes in, in Mongolian controlled territory in favor of providing Venetian intelligence and Venice had the best uh, spy network in the world that was able to profile all kingdoms, all courts, all uh, leaders, and look and look for their weaknesses. Where could where could they be corrupted? Where were their weak points? And that that was how a lot of people today are, to this very day are confused. How the hell did these bar barbarians of Mongolia under the Khans successfully uh, thwart again and again and again all of these Western kingdoms, um, include? And it was because they had intelligence. They were, you know, they, were, they had a lot of assistance. So Venice was the place that was funding, especially after the the Reformation, uh, different sects and self divided sects within Christianity, uh, Lutheran Lutherans, Calvinists, uh, Catholics, um, and more to just kill each other nonstop. It was like you know today's uh, never ending wars in the Middle East between Muslims and Jews and fake Christians and stuff. Um, so it, it all were being funded by the same, uh, evil financiers, all sides. So this was ongoing. Germany lost two, a third of their population. Some cities lost a full half of their population during the 30 years war. Uh, it was going to be a dark age. Civilization couldn't continue. And some leading people around, uh, France, the, the French finance minister, uh, Mazarin organized, uh, over several years, um, Everybody, all powers, and there was something like there, there, there were thousands of of mul multitudes of interests. There was no German state. There was like two thousand jurisdictions in Germany run by prince electors representing, you know, Protestantism, Catholic Catholicism, who had only been killing each other with mercenaries for a long time. There was no German nation. Uh, France was in a better place for various reasons. I go to, I, I go through in my class in my upcoming paper. But the key that made this thing work after seven years of backdoor negotiations was the first two articles. The principal article one of Westphalia, 1648, that there shall be a Christian and universal peace and a perpetual true and sincere amity, that this peace and amity shall be observed and cultivated with such a sincerity and zeal that each party shall endeavor to procure the benefit, honor, and advantage of the other, that thus on all sides they may see that this peace and friendship in the Roman Empire and the Kingdom of France flourish by entertaining a good and faithful neighborhood. This is what is studied later on by, by American um, patriots, uh, people like John Quincy Adams study this when he's discussing his um, uh, community of uh, the international community of sovereign interests. So Quincy Adams had a whole Monroe doctrine uh, based upon the good neighbor policy and a community of sovereign nations that the U.S. would best maintain its self-interest by helping other nations stand on their own two feet, break free of colonialism, and importantly, never allow the enmeshment of of the US into foreign intrigue, but also like don't go around searching for monsters to destroy is the famous quote, but also to keep foreign imperial interests from it entering deeper into the Americas. That was John Quincy's whole uh, principle. Uh, Washington and Hamilton also enumerated this in their own clear way. This, so this, this is something that American patriots understood and Roosevelt understood this with his good neighbor policy that I mentioned before with, with Latin America. Uh, principle two is very important, especially if we're going to get anywhere today in, you know, the India-China conflicts or the is, you know, the different uh, Middle Eastern problems. You got to have this understood clearly. So, Article two, which again they don't teach you in school. If you if you take a political science class, you learn that the Peace of Westphalia was when we all learned to just stop killing each other and re respect each other's rights to be left alone. That's the modern so sovereign nations. That's what we're told. But what I'm showing people here is. I've never met a political science student or even professor who understood these two things, even though they're the first, it's the, it's the, it's the preamble of the damn thing. But the, the second one is on forgiveness in a real way that there shall be on, on the one side and on the other per, 
perpetual oblivion, amnesty, or pardon of all that has been committed since the beginning of these troubles, in what place or what manner soever the hostilities have been practiced, in such a manner that nobody under any pretext whatsoever shall practice any acts of hostility, entertain any enmity, or cause any trouble to, to each other. The thing that makes this work is not that it's just everybody agreeing to these nice pretty ideas. It's that you have infrastructure projects for the next decades. There's a fight by, by people like uh, Colbert, who is what inspires Hamilton and Ben Franklin and many other founding fathers to create the American system of political economy, of protectionism, dirigism, the investment of treasuries into public works instead of into speculation or into war. So they invest, you can just see the growth of canals that are being built in Germany, in France, uh, academies, uh, trade schools, right, to give people real skill sets. Um, scientific academies as well are being built up, like the French Academy of Sciences, uh, Germany, that similar things are, be are happening there. So you have this economic, real economic development happening to give vitality to this, because you can't just tell people whose families have been killing each other over religious differences for generations. You can't just tell them, read these two things and uh, you're good. No way. Same thing for the Middle East today. It's not going to work that way. So the economic uh, aspect was key. This is replicated exactly when you look at the UN Charter itself. And I'm, I'm, I, I just picked the first four elements, sections within Article 1 of the UN Charter, um, authored by Sumner Wells and Roosevelt, because, again, nobody reads this stuff. You know, like, it's important just to take it in while thinking about the drama we're going through. But coming out of, I mean, again, this is 1941, this is written. But uh, <clears throat> the idea of, number one, to maintain international peace and security, and to, to that end, to take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace, and for the suppression of acts of aggression or other breaches of the peace, and to bring about by peaceful means and in conformity with the principles of justice and international law, adjustment or settlement of international disputes or situations which might lead to a breach of the peace. So again, total... A denial of things like R2P. It can't happen if you actually follow this. Number two, to develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principles of equal rights and self-determination of the peoples, and to take other appropriate measures to strengthen universal peace. Self-determination, again, not compatible with world government. Number three, to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems of an economic, social, cultural, or humanitarian character, and in promoting and encouraging respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. And again, no NATO 2030 here. Um, this is actually much more in alignment with the BRI, which I'll say something more about the Belt and Road Initiative. And finally, number four, to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations in the attainment of these common ends. And as I write here in my article, just in case any imperially minded legalist wished to read the charter loosely, article two, the next one, quickly makes it clear these are my words here, but then then the I quote from the charter again. The organization is based on the principle of the sovereign equality of all of its members. Not world government, again, just to really hammer this home, okay? So what was done was that, <clears throat> to, just like in Westphalia, to give vitality, you had the Bretton Woods Conference that Roosevelt and uh, Harry Dexter White, uh, who represented the U.S. De uh, delegation with Henry Morgenthau, they organized the New Hampshire Bretton Woods Conference of 1944, which brought together delegations, hundreds of dele delegates from India, Africa, South America, Russia, Europe. Uh, Britain obviously had their major delegation. And there was a, a major, China as well, ma big representation by China. Um, the idea was to flesh out what would be the conditions for the new world financial system after World War II, and what would be the projects that would give vitality to the world. Now, every single delegation, there, there's incredible um, reports of the Chinese um, program by, of Sun Yat-sen, so that both Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang, as well as Mao and Zhu Enlai, all co-endorsed for their delegation, because at the time they still had an alliance, um, a one-China alliance, they, they co-endorsed their program for the reconstruction of China using Sun Yat-sen, the first president, the first Christian president of China, the revolutionary, his de international development program 
featuring rail, water projects, ports, and everything else. Both sides co-endorsed it, and the U.S. delegates loved it, gave their full backing. India had massive development strategies that they had said, okay, let's let's have let's have this define our uh, post-colonial age, South America, Russia, Eastern Europe, everywhere. It wasn't just the, the Marshall Plan, and the U.S. fully backed all of that. So the idea of creating the World Bank, the IMF, um, or the GATT, uh, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, these which were all Bretton Woods institutions, and keep in mind Der Harry Dexter White, who was an anti-colonialist, a friend of FDR, and who believed in these things, he became the first IMF director. He was he died in 1948 for a very specific reason. Um, the British delegations were they were there to defend again the British Empire. Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, did not inspire Roosevelt. He was an enemy of Roosevelt. Roosevelt thought he was insane. He called him a mathematician and a fetishist, not an economist. Keynes called Roosevelt on record um, an incompetent, an economic incompetent idiot. Um, Roosevelt's personal secretary, of, uh, Francis Perkins, records all of this. So, you know, the, the, the idea that Roosevelt was a Keynesian is a complete myth that was created by Roosevelt's enemies after Roosevelt died in early death in April 12th, 1945. Uh, but, but Keynes and the British delegation were totally in opposition. Their whole plan was to, to save the empire, to stop all development, to keep control of their colonies, and to keep control in the city of London and the Bank of England. That's what Keynes' Bancor was all about as, a, as an international trading unit. Uh, Soros is, uh, anyway, that, that's sort of the, the foundation for today's discussion of a Green New Deal is to recreate the Keynesian Bancor closed system. It's not based upon the Rooseveltian idea of a New Deal, which is being internationalized of great projects going out abroad to create new wealth in an open system of international development. So this is, this is just like, again, in Westphalia with the water projects and, and engineering projects, it's the same sort of spirit. And uh, Wallace with White and Sumner Wells and, and FDR are all talking about bringing in Russia and China and the United States as the core of the foundation for a new financial system. Britain would be pulled in, but would have to obey the rules set by Russia, China, and the United States. They're very clear on that. The last, um, the last slide I have is um, um, a, a the recording of a, of a conflict between FDR and Churchill in 1941, just as the Atlantic Charter was being si signed and, you know, Ch Churchill up here was looking all grim and blue. Um, Roosevelt tells Churchill, who's now realizing that, uh, that the empire is going to be dismantled if Hitler is put down and, and uh, they're deciding on the rules of the new system. Uh, so he's confused. What what uh, what are these twenty? What are what what is wrong with nineteenth century colonial methods that Roosevelt is making fun of and saying that we need twentieth century methods uh, instead now? And uh, Roosevelt clarifies, saying, "Whichever of your ministers recommends a policy which takes the wealth and raw materials out of a colonial country, but which returns nothing to the people of that country in consideration, twentieth century methods." That's, so those are 19th century methods. 20th century methods involve bringing industry to these colonies. 20th century methods includes increasing the wealth of a people by increasing their standard of living, by educating them, by bringing them sanitation, by making sure that they get a return for the raw, material, raw wealth of their country. And then Elliot Roosevelt writes in his narrative, around the room, all of us were leaning, leaning forward attentively. Hopkins, that's Harry Hopkins, uh, Roosevelt's best friend, was grinning. Commander Thompson, Churchill's aide, was looking glum and alarmed. The prime minister himself was beginning to look apoplectic. You mentioned India, he growled. Yes, I can't believe that we can fight a war against fascist slavery and at the same time not work to free people all over the world from a backward colonial policy. Then Churchill says, but what about the Philippines? He's trying to take a shot at Roosevelt because that's an American colony. Roosevelt says, I'm glad you mentioned them. They get their independence, you know, in 1946. And they've gotten modern sanitation, modern education. Their rate of illiteracy has gone down steadily. There can be no tampering with the empire's economic agreements. Roosevelt says they're artificial. They're the foundation for our greatness. The peace, said father, that's how Elliot obviously calls his dad, uh, cannot include any continued despotism 
The structure of the peace demands and will get equality of peoples. Equality of peoples involves the utmost freedom of competitive trade. Will anyone suggest that Germany's attempt to dominate trade in Central Europe was not a major contributing factor to the war? So just to get across, I mean, this this goes on and people can read the entire book as he saw it, which is where this, this comes from, um, from 1946. They can get this online. Just type it in, archive.org, read it. It's really worth reading. Um, and it gets clear that Roosevelt had thoroughly developed passionate ideas for greening the Sahara Desert with big infrastructure projects, much like what Gaddafi tried doing uh, that NATO destroyed in 2011 with the great man-made water project. That was Roosevelt was already talking about that. And the idea was to take the U.S. arsenal that was built up productively for war and convert it into an actual arsenal for democracy. Uh, there's a really good book people should read called Freedom's Forge by Arthur Hermann, um, which goes through this, this plan to actually create an international new deal to extend what was done successfully. And people like Kwame Nkrumah, you know, the, the, the leader of the Pan-African movement, the, the president of Ghana, he studied in America, he studied the Tennessee Valley Authority and all of these big projects that inspired him to get an idea of how Africa as a whole could liberate itself and, and pull itself into modernity. Um, yeah, model on the US New Deal. Yeah, totally. And this is done all over South America too. And uh, and beyond China, India, again, all had arrangements. And it was the British who stopped, you know, the, Mountbatten, the guy who sponsored, uh, the, the pedophile who sponsored uh, Prince Philip, his uncle, was the guy in charge of India who was the one who negotiated to keep British control for India one extra year longer to give them a chance to create the right fault lines in place over ethnic tensions and, and religious tensions between Muslims in Pakistan and Hindus and Sikhs and, and inversely, right? And it would just be an ongoing constant fight with British run and guided intelligence services amongst all of these nations playing the Yagos lighting fires, kind of like the British are still trying to do today uh, to keep this, this peace from actually happening. Um, I think similar things can be found as well regarding uh, China too. You're going to find all sorts of skull and bones uh, and British intelligence operations all over both sides, infiltrating both sides of the communists as well as the Kuomintang, um, which are again, lighting fires and you have patriots as well as traitors on both sides. You have good people like Zhu Enlai working for the four modernizations of China uh, to bring back the spirit of Sun Yat-sen, as well as people like the Gang of Four who are these, you know, um, utopian ideologues who bring about the cultural rev revolution and try to basically undo any type of good uh, and hit it, they basically try to undo 2,500 years of Chinese history um, in one one decade and so you, you got these these deep state expressions in all cultures that are being organized by the same British octopus which is essentially as I said not really British it's it's Venetian because before these families chose to take over Britain uh, in 1688 to 1694 was when they set up the Bank of England. Before that, it was a Venetian. Everyone understood this. A right. Venetian parasite. That's where the families were based. Be, and they they merchants of Venice, it. huh? The merchants of Venice. The merchants of Venice. Exactly. They were the Iagos. The uh, exactly the Shylocks, and they used uh, different figures, different you know uh, bankers with with Jewish heritage, not because it's a Jewish conspiracy at all. That's not the case. They just simply use certain useful idiots um, that were very good sociopathic uh, operators that they granted authority to and wealth to and protected as little dynastic mercenaries like the Rothschilds to carry out the duties of empire after the 18th century. This had been going on already a few hundred years earlier, but it's not like this thing goes back. And I'm just talking to people right now who are still on the fence or trying to figure out what, you know, th there's a lot of Jewish conspiracy stuff out there. And I want to give people a sense that there's, this thing goes far back before even Judaism was created. It's an oligarchical system of a continuity of families and ideologies that are committed to a very satanic view of human beings made in the image of mud and a very evil creator that uh, made the elite in their, in, in the image of evil. Um, so there's this whole like dogma that, transmits itself over many generations and has certain common characteristics to it, but they're always afraid of the exact same attributes of create creative passion and discoveries of truth that come out of human beings who don't obey, obey their rules. They're, you know, rules-based orders that they try to get us to, to suck ourselves into.